Okay, I think we can get started. Um, so welcome to, to everyone here in the room. Um, maybe it's still, a few people are still coming. Um, and also well, welcome to the online audience. Um, to this session, which is uh, here, at least in Japanese time, uh, quite uh, late in the afternoon on the third day of the IGF. Uh, my name is Rosanna Fani. Um, I have been actually uh, working for the Center for European Policy Studies, uh, in short, SEPS, uh, until last week. Um, uh, and um, this session um, is a very special one um, because it's a topic that I'm personally very passionate about that I've been working on for quite some time now. Um, and it is also a special session because I think the topic that we are going to address today is normally not really at the center um, of the IGF discussions, um, which is, of course, the use of AI and emerging technologies in the broader defense context. Why? why? Why is that topic relevant for the IGF? Well, let's just consider for a moment that almost a, all AI systems that we are currently speaking about, um, the models that are currently being developed, um, they are, uh, of course, used for civilian purposes, but at the same time, they could also be used for defense purposes. So that means they are dual use. Um, and as we also know today, literally anyone has access to data, um, and can easily um, uh, set up machine learning techniques or um, algorithmic models, um, can use coding um, assistance such as ChatGPT. And so this means that basically almost uh, all the technology, the computing power, programming languages, code, um, encryption information, big data algorithms, and so on, um, has become dual use. And um, of course, the military, not only the civilian sector, but also the military has high stakes in understanding and using these uh, technological tools to their own advantage. Of course, we know that these developments are not really new. Um, things started uh, with the DARPA, um, which some of you may are familiar with, the US defense in-house uh, R&D think tank. Um, and DARPA was uh, already at the time central to developing the internet, software, and also AI that we all use today. But at, as we now see with the conflict um, in Ukraine, AI is already in full-scale use by defense actors and also has the uh, big potential to change power dynamics considerably. And our panelists will speak to that. Um, while we have seen um, numerous developments, the use of AI already um, in those contexts, we see that there's quite a disconnect to the civilian um, developments in AI, which include a large number of ethical principles, ethical guidelines, regulation, soft hard law, hard law, and so on. However, we don't really see that happening yet in the defense realm, um, which for me is quite concerning because the stakes and the risks in the defense context may even be higher than in civilian ones. Um, and it, this is also, I think, a great example for, um, or a surprising example, um, when we look at uh, the current uh, European uh, Union um, approach to AI, so the much applauded um, AI Act, um, which is risk-based. Um, it actually excludes uh, virtually all AI applications that are used in a defense context. So AI is completely excluded from the scope of the AI Act, which is funny because it's called risk-based approach, right? So this, uh, just as a means of introduction, um, we have a lot of urgent questions and very little answers so far, so I hope that our panelists will enlighten us. Um, I will uh, introduce the panelists um, in, uh, in the order that they are speaking, and uh, before they are speaking, so um, I will um, yeah, now introduce the first speaker. And um, I also first want to introduce uh, Paula, uh, my uh, now former colleague who's uh, based in Brussels and joins us today um, as our online moderator. Um, and um, we have uh, foreseen uh, half an hour or mm, yeah, maybe the second half of the session, so to say, where we want to uh, hear from you, um, so answer any questions that you have. Um, so with the panelists, obviously, so uh, get, get your questions ready. Um, and I think now it's time to, uh, to dive right into the discussion. 
And uh, uh, to do that, I will introduce the first speaker who is joining us here in person. Um, I will introduce Fernando Giancorti. Um, he's a Lieutenant General of the Italian Air Force, uh, retired now. Um, and he's also a former president of the Centro Alti Studi per la Difesa, which is in short the Italian Defense University. Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rosanna. I'm very honored to be here to share some thoughts about this topic, which uh, in the great debate about ethical use of uh, emerging and disruptive technology kinds of lags behind. We have heard so many organizations uh, in, involved in so much, and rightly so, in uh, ensuring ethical behaviors uh, in uh, many of the domains of our lives. And we don't see as many taking care of one of the most uh, dangerous and relevant threats to our security and to the lives of our fellow people. So uh, this panel, which I think is the only one here about the topic, uh, is meant to uh, give a, let's say, a, a call on this. Wars are on the rise, unfortunately, and conflicts. Uh, I don't need to expand on that. I think we have enough from media. And uh, in the field, uh, many, uh, a lot of violence is going on. And, uh, and while this is in the forefront of attention, not so uh, the implication of uh, what is being already used on the fields. Yeah? Closer? Yeah. So, uh, I argue that this is important both for ethical and functional reasons uh, according to a research recently published uh, about uh, ethical uh, AI in the Italian defense, a case study, uh, commanders need clear guidance about these uh, new tools because uh, first uh, the ethical awareness is ingrained both in education and in the uh, system which uh, implies also swift penalties if you fail and this is due to the uh, in democracies to the assignment of uh, the monopoly of violence to to the armed forces so ethical uh, ethical awareness is high and also uh, of very practical grounds accountability issues uh, commanders uh, are afraid that without clear guidelines they will have to decide and, uh, and then they will be held accountable for that. And furthermore, and this is another major point, what came out from the research, uh, which by the way was uh, authored by the moderator and co-authored by me, uh, you can find it on uh, LinkedIn, uh, the, there is what I call the bad guy dilemma, which is a very functional uh, problem about ethics uh, in uh, AI and uh, EDT uh, in general, applied to warfare, which is if we do not uh, carefully uh, balance value criteria with effectiveness, and so we don't do a good job in, in finding that balance, the, and the bad guys do not, uh, let's say, follow the same principles, uh, we will be in, in disadvantage. This is a, another uh, worry uh, that came out from the research. So now let's go very quickly in a few words uh, through what's going on on the battlefield uh, about this in the industry and in the policy realm. On the battlefield, we can see three main uh, timelines. 
before Ukraine, during Ukraine, and we can imagine what's going to happen after Ukraine, given many indicators. Before Ukraine, uh, AI was not much used in uh, warfare at all, and, uh, but for experiments and a few isolated cases. But with the breakout of the Ukraine war, things have changed massively, which means that there has been a strive to employ all the means uh, um, uh, available. There is no evidence, there is a very recent report uh, a few weeks ago um, from uh, the Center for Naval Analysis, uh, which shows that there is no evidence of extensive use of AI in the Ukraine war. But except for uh, decision-making support, which is, of course, critical. Now, uh, still, there are several systems that can employ AI, and maybe they have in cases. And uh, there is, for sure, a big investment in trying to increase the capabilities of artificial intelligence in warfare. What we can expect, given also the, multi, the big, huge programs that are being developed, uh, in which already by design include uh, artificial intelligence, there will be a huge increase in that. And the industry, as a matter of fact, also because it's a dual-use industry, largely, is uh, working much on this, and uh, we cannot uh, expand on the systems that are being developed, but it, really there will be a major change in the nature of warfare due to AI. So, this is briefly what happens now in the battlefield, what happens in the industry with governments, commissions, and now what happens in the policy realm. The policy realm, the EU, does not regulate defense because it's outside the treaties. But Europe, the EU, is doing many things that are outside the treaties uh, regarding defense, especially for the Ukraine war. So it's kind of a fig leaf, let's say, mm, I think, this uh, point. The UN, uh, as a major international stakeholder, has focused on uh, highly polarized uh, Lethal Autonomous Weapons Initiative, which doesn't move forward. But there is no comprehensive approach to tackle with a more general framework. Single nations have developed uh, ethical frameworks for uh, AI in defense, but uh, by definition, and remember the bad guy dilemma, these kind of frameworks are relevant if they can be generalized at the largest possible level. So, we uh, should, I think, according also to the multi-stakeholder approach that is typical, of, for example, of this forum, uh, have the UN join and lead the way for a comprehensive ethical framework, uh, kind of a digital use in bello, in a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, the UN <laughs> was born out of a terrible war. Its core business is to prevent and mitigate conflicts. And, uh, and as we, there are some good news. As uh, Peggy Hicks said of the Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights on Monday, she said, we don't need to invent from scratch an approach to, uh, an approach to digital rights because we have decades of experience in the human rights framework application. I can say that we don't need to invent from scratch uh, a way to implement and operationalize uh, ethical principles in, uh, in operations because we have decade, decades long approach in application of international humanitarian law with uh, procedures and structures dedicated to that. The bad news is that we don't have those general principles to operationalize 
at the strategic, operational, and tactical level. Before coming here, uh, in my previous job, I was, uh, I've been the president for the Center for Higher Studies, uh, which is our national defense university, but also the operation, before that, the operational commander of the Air Force. And I can, can guarantee you that every operation has a very tight, rigorous approach to, for compliance to uh, uh, international humanitarian law, which goes to specific rules for the soldier on the battlefield, rules of engagement and things like that. So my, um, let's say, thought that can be, of course, discussed, it's very simplistic put in this way, and maybe in the question and answer we can uh, expand, but it's that we should really get a, a general effort because I think there is evidence that these ugly things that are wars and conflicts are not going away. We better try to do our best to mitigate them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fernando, uh, for your contributions. Um, and I guess we will, uh, I have already some questions <laughs> prepared. We will come back to you um, when we speak about the, the question and, and answer session. Um, so, yes, exactly. Uh, I will hand over to the next uh, speaker, um, who's also here in, uh, with us in person, um, Pete Furlong. Uh, he's a senior policy analyst at the Internet Policy Unit at the Tony, Tony Blair Institute um, think tank. Um, and um, yeah, the floor is yours, Pete. Sure, yeah, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. Um, I think, you know, it's important when we talk about these issues that, you know, we kind of ground it in, you know, specific technologies and, and think about what technologies we're talking about. Um, I think, you know, like Fernando mentioned, uh, you know, we can often get caught in these conversations about lethal autonomous weapons that can be, you know, pretty fraught, but, you know, there's a lot of other technologies that are important to talk about. And, you know, especially when you think about the emerging and disruptive technology beyond just AI. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the Ukraine war, like things like satellite internet are a very good example of that. Um, but also kind of the broader use of drones um, in the warfare. And, you know, I think it's important to realize that extends beyond just traditional military drones, but also through to like consumer, commercial and hobbyist drones as well. And I think that, you know, when we talk about things like that, uh, it's important to realize that, you know, these systems weren't designed for the battlefield. And I think that's often the case for a lot of dual use AI systems as well. And they weren't designed, you know, with the, maybe the reliability and the performance expectations that, you know, a, a war, you know, brings. And, you know, the reality is that when you're fighting for your life, you're not necessarily thinking about these issues. And so it's important that, you know, in these forums that we start thinking about and, and talking about these issues because, you know, this technology has a really transformative effect on these conflicts. And I think, you know, the use of consumer drones in Ukraine is, is a great example of, you know, an area where Ukraine's been able to leverage, you know, uh, you know, U.S. and Turkish sophisticated attack drones, but also, you know, simple, like, custom-built, uh, even, like, DJI, which is, like, a, you know, consumer commercial drone provider, um, drones from, from different companies as well. And I think that, you know, you're really blurring the lines between these different types of technologies which have different governance mechanisms and different rules in place. Um, so I think that's important for us to think about and I think the one other thing that I would bring up is that, you know, again, moving beyond just the discussion about AI and, and weaponry, but also by the military more broadly, um, you really have the potential to escalate the pace of war um, significantly. And I think that's something for us to really consider when we talk about things like, you know, ensuring there's space for diplomacy, ensuring there's space for, for other interventions as well. Um, and, and again, really, the intent is to accelerate the pace of war, and we need to, to really think about the consequences of that as well. So, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, also good uh, that you came back uh, to this aspect that I already mentioned in the beginning that um, the war, so to say, are now <laughs> almost, as you say, like a community, you know, because everyone can build a drone, can develop a, a model and, and kind of be an own actor almost. And, and that, of course, um, has uh, manifold implications. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I will now hand it over to the third uh, speaker who joins us online uh, from New Delhi. Um, and I hope we are also able to, to see her on screen soon. Um, I'll introduce her in the meantime. Um, Shimona Mohan is a junior fellow at the Center for uh, Security Strat Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation, um, also think tank, <laughs> um, based in India and New Delhi. Um, Shimona, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Rosanna. Just wanted to check if you can see and hear me well before I start off. Excellent. We can see and hear you well. Fantastic. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, for having me on this panel. Um, it's uh, the perpetual uh, blessing and curse of having uh, talented panelists that my job is simultaneously easier and harder. Um, but I hope uh, the, um, the 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 issues that I will be speaking about will be of value as well. Um, so uh, since uh, Fernando and uh, Pete sort of spoke about um, why ethics are important already, uh, I will just probably take the conversation further and into the domain of two separate um, methodologies around AI in in defense applications that we have seen being employed recently. Um, and how they've sort of come about in the defense space. Um, so the first one, which um, uh, which I'd like to, to sort of give a, a characterization around is explainable AI. Um, and while there is no consolidated definition or, or characterization of what explainable AI is, it's usually understood as um, computing models or best practices or a mix of both uh, technical and non-technical um, um, issue areas which are used to make uh, the black box of the AI system a little bit more transparent so that you can sort of delve in and see if there are any ethical issues or if there are any blocks that you're facing with your AI systems in, um, in both civilian and military applications, you can sort of go in and fix them. So, so that's definitely something that we're seeing uh, coming up a lot. And as Rosanna mentioned earlier, um, DARPA was actually uh, at the forefront of this research uh, a few years ago. And now we are seeing a lot more players sort of come into this uh, and, and sort of adopt XAI systems or at least put in resources into the research and application side of them. Um, so, for example, Sweden, um, the U.S., and the U.K. have already started research activities around using XAI in their military AI architectures. And then we also have a lot of civilian applications uh, which are being explored by the EU, um, as well as market standards by industry leaders like, um, like Google, IBM, Microsoft, and uh, numerous other smaller entities which have much more niche sectoral applications around this. So that's one. Um, another thing that uh, a lot of us are sort of noticing in the defense AI space now is uh, something called responsible AI. Um, and responsible AI is sort of understood as this broad-based umbrella terminology that uh, that encompasses within it stuff like trust, trustworthy AI, reliable AI, um, even explainable AI to a degree. Um, and it's it's mostly just the practice of sort of designing and development and also deploying AI. Uh, which uh, sort of impacts society in a fair manner. Um, so countries like the US, the UK, Switzerland, France, um, Australia, and a number of countries under NATO have also sort of started to talk about and implement ethical and responsible AI strategies within their military AI architectures. Um, and for those who work around this area, uh, they may also be aware about the Responsible AI in the Military Summit in the Netherlands, which was convened earlier this year as sort of a global call to ensure that responsible AI is part of military AI development strategies for uh, about 80 countries that were there at this at this particular meeting. Um, but the interesting thing, and this is where I'd like to bring in uh, a geopolitical angle to this, uh, is also the fact that out of those 80 governments that were present at this meeting, uh, only about 60 of them actually signed this global call. Um, and uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the country where I come from, India, was one of the 20 that did not sign this call. 
Um, so the uh, analysis for this ranges from considerations around national security uh, and a prioritization of national security over international security mechanisms, uh, which is something that countries like India have pursued before as well. So India is actually one of the four or five countries uh, which have not signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty either. And that was on the same sort of principles of ensuring its national security over um, aligning itself with international security um, uh, rules and regulations um, and, and softer laws. So, so that's, that's uh, an interesting uh, dilemma here. And another dilemma that I'd like to sort of put my finger into uh, is uh, something that Fernando mentioned earlier, which is the bad guy dilemma. Uh, and of course, uh, there's no clear answers to, to sort of solve this bad guy dilemma, uh, but something that's been brought about by the responsible AI in the military domains um, um, discourse around uh, military AI is the fact that AI-based weapon systems like lethal autonomous weapons and other defense aids, which have not been screened for responsible AI considerations, carry a lot of tangible risks uh, of exhibiting biased or error-prone um, information processing for the operational environment in which they are deployed. So systems which actually don't have responsible AI or ethical AI uh, frameworks around them also pose unintentional exclusive harms, not only towards adversaries uh, against which they are, these, these military AI systems are employed, but also possibly for the entity employing them itself, uh, which makes their use unnecessarily high risk despite their uh, other benefits which they, which they give to, to the employing entity. Um, and uh, while we're on the subject of ethics and AI, I'd also like to just uh, spotlight another sort of aspect of, of, of this ethics debate, which is um, gender and racial biases in military AI. So we already know that there's a ton of biases that AI brings to the fore, not only in civilian applications, but also in defense applications. And something that's given a little bit more, uh, a little bit less uh, emphasis on is uh, gender and uh, racial biases. Um, so gender is sort of seen as a soft security issue in policy considerations, as opposed to hard security deliberations, which are given a lot more focus. And the issue of gender in tech, whether it's in terms of female workforce participation, um, is also characterized as sort of an ethical concern rather than a core tech one. So this characterization of gender as an add-on um, essentially makes it sort of a non-issue in security and tech agendas. And if at all it is present, it's, it's usually put down as a checkbox to performatively satisfy policy or compliance-related compulsions. Um, but we've seen that uh, gender and AI uh, and race biases in AI systems can have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 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 devastating effects on uh, on the applications where they are employed. Um, so there was actually a Stanford study a few years ago uh, on publicly available information on 133 biased AI systems, uh, and this was across different sectors. So it's not just limited to military AI, but across uh, the ambit of dual use AI systems. Um, and about 44% of these actually exhibited gender biases, um, amongst which 26 included both gender and racial biases. So similar uh, results have also been obtained by the MIT Media Lab, uh, which conducted the gender shade study for AI biases, um, where it was seen that um, the the uh, softwares, the, the facial recognition softwares, which are which are popularly employed in a lot of places now, um, recognize, say, for example, white male faces quite accurately, but they don't recognize darker female faces up to 34% of the time which means that if your particular AI system that you employ in your military AI um, architecture has this kind of biased facial recognition system, 34% of the time when it looks at a human, it doesn't uh, recognize her as a human at all, uh, which is, of course, a huge ethical uh, 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 issue as well as uh, an operational issue. So going back to the argument uh, given by Fernando that ethics are not only just, uh, just, a, just a soft soft issue, they, they also have a lot of operational risks attached to them. Um, and my last point here would then be uh, also about how um, we, we're seeing these sort of blanks emerge in how military AI is, is, uh, is developing in terms of both gender and races. 
So the first, uh, uh, and, and these blanks are sort of threefold. So the first blank here would be the technological blank itself, which means when you have and are developing these AI systems that you have skewed data sets or you have uh, uncorrected biased algorithms, which are sort of producing these biases in the first place. Um, the second blank then would be um, your legal systems, your weapons review processes, which don't have um, gender reviews, gender sensitive reviews, or, uh, or race specific reviews, or uh, any other uh, particular aspect of your military AI system, which could be biased. Uh, and then the third set of blanks would be um, a normative blanks, which would be in terms of a lack of policy discourse around AI biases in military AI systems um, and how they affect uh, the populations which they affect most. Um, so the idea for us now is to sort of take forward um, these conversations about ethics, about biases, about uh, geopolitical uh, specificities in military AI um, policy conversations and sort of put them where wherever we can so that these don't get left behind and we are not sort of only looking at military AI systems as killing machines um, and not as, uh, as, as systems that need to be regulated according to a certain set of rules and regulations. Um, thank you so much and I look forward to all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shimona. That was uh, also super insightful. And also, thanks a lot for uh, raising the issue of gender and race, which I think is um, already a big issue in um, yeah, the civilian context. But again, this is replicated um, in a defense context and definitely not uh, sufficient attention at the moment, at least is paid to this issue. Um, okay, so um, that concludes the first round of the interventions. Um, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Um, I will hand it now over to our online moderator, Paula, to give us a short uh, summary, so to say, of the points that we've just heard. And then maybe also already uh, start um, with a question and answer session. So I'm taking some online questions first. Um, and I also, I will invite you, the three of you, um, once you answer, you can also refer to the points that um, you made as we don't have a, so to say, a circle of um, uh, points uh, or reactions from your side, um, but feel free to include them um, in the question answer session. Um, okay, over to you, Paula. Yes, thank you. Greetings from Brussels, um, where it is still in the morning. So thank you for, for an interesting start into, the, into my day, so to speak. Um, for me, there are so many interesting points that you've raised that it's really difficult to just settle on three takeaways. Uh, for me, the first one would be, though, that we need ethical principles at international level so that we need to find some kind of agreement so that we can move forward with ensuring more ethical practices in military AI applications that also relate to accountability issues that were raised by the commanders in the Italian military defense. Um, the second one is, for me, the main takeaway probably of the entire session is that the conversation is much bigger than laws. And by just focusing on legal autonomous weapon systems, we really miss out on much of the conversation on explainable AI, responsible AI, and also what you mentioned, uh, Shimona, in the, last, in the last intervention, that we really miss out on gender and racial biases if we just focus on laws and these extreme use cases. So I think really that the conversation is bigger than loss is one of the main key main takeaways. And another one that complicates the whole use of AI in military is of course um, geopolitics and the power plays that are pitting as stakeholders against each other. So I think this is already um, so many interesting points. And I would love to give our online audience a chance to raise their questions. Um, please feel free to Raise your hands, type in the chat if you have any questions. Um, but if there aren't any, <laughs> I have my own questions, which I'm really excited to ask. So I will just start off with my own question um, and then come back to the online participants. Please don't hesitate to, to be in touch via the chat. So what I'm wondering is, um, on the ethical principles that we need for AI and military use. I'm wondering, do we need different ones than for those that we already have? We know how many ethics guidelines are floating around and about, and I'm wondering, do we need different ones for use of AI in military contexts? I also heard bias plays a role, responsible AI, explainable AI. Do we need ethical principles that look different to those that we have right now to cover um, the military domain? So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the continuation of the discussion. 
Okay, I don't know who wants to uh, address this question. And then we also, of course, go to an in-person round of questions. <laughs> you will not be forgotten, but maybe we can uh, first address this one. I don't know who wants to go first. Okay, we do um, first this round, and then we'll have another round of questions um, with the in-person one. Yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it's a great question. And I think, you know, in an ideal world, um, you know, these principles would be the same. Um, and I think, you know, that would be great. Uh, but I, I also just think there's an element of maybe not necessarily do we need different principles, do, but do we need maybe more targeted principles that address some of the issues, you know, that we're seeing more specifically? Um, because I think, you know, again, it, it, most of these AI principles are, are very useful and important, but they're, you know, intentionally broad because they're meant for a wide variety of applications. And I think that, you know, that poses a challenge when we talk about how do we implement them and, you know, you can end up in a situation where different countries interpret these things very differently. Um, and I think that's, that's maybe the risk in having, you know, pretty broad uh, interpretation here. Shimona and then Fernando, you also want to say something? Yeah, maybe we have Shimona first and then you. Excuse me? We will have Shimona first and then you can go. Yeah. Please. Okay, thank you, Rosanna. Um, just to just to add on to to Pete's already um, a very substantive point, um, I, I I would also like to highlight the fact that in the absence of national um, policy prioritization of military AI, it's very hard for countries to actually go ahead and form intergovernmental um, actions around military AI. So while we speak of ethical principles, since AI itself is not really a tangible entity that you can control via borders, um, the, the most effective sort of ethical principles might only emerge from intergovernmental processes around this. But to get to that step where we are discussing substantive uh, ethical principles in substantive uh, intergovernmental processes, I think the first step is to, is to have a good national AI policy um, for all the countries who are currently de developing military AI systems or any other systems uh, around AI which might have uh, military offshoots. Um, so, so that would be sort of my, um, my two cents on this. Very quickly, I think that the uh, quality of the process does not change from, from what has always happened. Uh, also, for all the other ethical issues that uh, have been uh, raised and tackled, uh, for example, after World War II with the uh, constitution of the UN, uh, and then the implementation of the uh, agreed guidelines, there have always been a very uh, dialectic and uh, contradictory process. And uh, we will never get a perfect framework that everybody is going to comply with but striving for the best uh, possible uh, balance, uh, I mean, I, I think I, it has no alternative because the alternative is to let things go, <laughs> you know, uh, in possibly in the worst possible way. So um, we have no certainty uh, according also to what we see for the other big agreements, that, that in, uh, agreements about the nuclear and uh, also, you know, unconventional weapons and many other uh, frameworks. And Shimona mentioned uh, exactly that some countries uh, prefer the national interest in specific cases. And so this is going to happen. But th this doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to push forward the um, compliance as much as possible through the, uh, as it has been said, the intergovernmental uh, process and, uh, in, and especially the organizations that are the responsibility to promote this. Thank you, fantastic. Um, we're already in, in the midst of the debate. Um, we will now take the uh, in-person questions, maybe also uh, one after each other. And, and then I also hear from Paula that we have another online question, so we will take that afterwards. But first, um, if you would like to uh, ask a question, also maybe briefly introduce um, your uh, name, your affiliation. Um, 
I see you don't have a microphone. Maybe you would like to use this one. It's a bit uh, um, far away, but um, and if you have this one already. Yes, um, my name is Julius Endert from DW Academy from Germany, uh, so from a uh, Deutsche Welle broadcaster. So I would li like to ask Fernando, as from your perspective as a military leader, so does AI make our world safer or not? Because we are coming from the massive retali reti retaliation strategy from 25 years ago. And, and, and if I see now that we are living in a situation where we may, may think from, an, from a perspective of states or NATO that a preemptive strike is better when the other side has massive uh, um, uh, AI cap capacities and also in, in tactics when, when we compare our own capacity if, capacities on the battlefield, then we also might think, okay, let's let's go for a preemptive strike. And so that, in the end, would mean that our world will be more unsecure than it was before because of AI. So what do you think? That's Thank you. Uh, we will just take the other question first, and then, you, and then we'll answer together. If you would like to ask a question also now, I, I see you have a microphone accident. <laughs> and you have to switch it on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you. I'm Rafael Delis. I'm a scientist in infection biology, and I am concerned about an invisible battlefield, and that is biological warfare and non-state actors. Now with AI and deep learning, generating bioweapons has never been easier. So I'm, I'd like to use this forum to uh, ask uh, what should we do to ensure biosecurity and Peace. Thank you. Also, a very uh, a pressing question for sure, um, especially in the international context. Uh, over to the speakers for their replies. Maybe Fernando, you'd like to go first this time, and then I'll let uh, Shimona and Pete uh, fill in. Uh, the question is very interesting. By the way, this paper I just mentioned, the one of the CNA. Uh, talks about this also, whether um, massive use of AI will, uh, let's say, make things more stable or more unstable. Now, there, there are good grounds uh, to say that could be either way, and which is like things are always been. It could have been the other way, <laughs> one way or, or another. What I think, uh, and I'm very uh, interested in the augmented cognition that AI can bring. Uh, what I think that many strat strategic mistakes that led to wars, if we really get to uh, an excellent degree of uh, cognition, uh, augmented cognition, could be avoided. For example, uh, if, you, if you study wars, you see that most of the time there was a strategic miscalculation that led uh, decision makers to start wars that, for which they paid a very high price, much more than expected. Had they had lesser fog of war, most likely they wouldn't they would not have done that. The Ukraine case is a perfect case of that. So I think that if we can, and now we cannot, use AI for, a, for a, an actual uh, quantum leap in strategic decision making, then this should be a stabilizing factor for most of the cases. There will be anyway cases, in, I think, in which this augmented cognition will prompt, uh, you know, intervention. And so again, either or. But uh, better to go toward augmented cognition, uh, judging from the blood that has been shed uh, for miscalculation so far. Okay, um, Shimona, Pete, I don't know who wants to also add something, maybe also do the second question. Shimona, you wanna go next? Sure, um, I can, I can uh, add uh, just, a, just a, another point to, to Fernando's already 
very well done answer, and also take the second question um, uh, on the question of whether uh, military AI makes our world um, more um, more unsecure or safer. Uh, I, I think all weapon systems are developed with the with the singular focus of giving yourself an edge over your adversary. Um, as a result of which, uh, in in like a systemic format, it it definitely makes the world a lot less safe. Um, but then we also have this idea of uh, what kind of cobra effect will come about from this. What kind of um, uh, what kind of opposite effect can we see emerging from this? And I think Fernando highlights that very well when he says that um, this this augmented factor might lead to a higher threshold of of war, which might eventually then might eventually then make it safer. Um, but again, these are these are just uh, optimistic viewpoints at this point. Uh, and it remains to be seen how this plays out in the in the global scenario. Um, on the second question of, uh, of biosafety and security as well, uh, it's it's very correct to say that AI is something that will contribute a lot to this domain as well. Um, and in fact, uh, it's it's already a risk factor that a lot of um, issue domains and and experts are already aware of. So there's this documentary on Netflix. It's called uh, Unknown Killer Robots, and um, it, it was uh, it was chilling in the sense that it showcased a lot of these um, these military application potentials, which we haven't really explored a lot in the lethal autonomous weapons debate at, uh, at, at, at the intergovernmental level. Um, and one of these risk potential uh, factors was uh, how AI can be used to make a lot more poisons and biotoxins and generate them at an, at an alarming speed, which we as humans at this point are not capable of. And this is uh, even more exacerbated by um, generative AI applications now. Um, so uh, it's 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 very right to to have the assumption that AI will lead to a lot more of these risk potentials around biosecurity also coming up. But at the same time, anything that is um, a genius for the wrong uh, things can also be a genius for the good things. So let's let's hope that uh, while we have malicious actors or nefarious entities sort of taking over the biosecurity domain. Um, from the negative side, there are also scientists and and policy researchers um, and and normative actors working on uh, the regulation side to help prevent that from happening, or at least having punitive measures in place before uh, and when it happens. Um, and that's uh, unfortunately the best I can I can say for now. Yeah, and just to add to what my colleagues have said sort of quickly here, um, I think, you know, on the biological, you know, weapons side of things, I think, you know, one of the concerns that, that I have um, is that, you know, when you talk about for these types of use cases, right, if I'm using a generative AI system to develop some sort of, you know, drug to, to help people, right, that needs to work every time. Um, if I'm developing a biological pathogen um, for some sort of attack vector, it only needs to work once. And so I think there's a gap in terms of capabilities um, that you know, when we talk about trying to address uh, at this stage is, is very important for us to recognize. Um, and I think that it poses a significant challenge. Um, the good thing I will say is I think that on this issue of like biological weapons is something that people are starting to talk about a little bit more. Um, I know with like the UK Summit for AI Safety, um, that's been one of the topics that uh, is gonna be addressed at that. Um, and then just actually to, to build on what Fernando said earlier, I think uh, when we talk about this idea of improved cognition, um, I think you know one of the potential fears that I have with that is that cognition is only as good as your sensing. Um, and so actually my, my background's in, in robotics. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things in robotics that's very challenging, right, is that, you know, you can have a very good robotics software system, but if your sensors aren't strong enough um, and your sensors aren't able to perceive uh, the information, then, you know, that doesn't really buy you anything. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to consider that, you know, these AI software systems exist in a broader system and in, in a broader ecosystem. And it's important to consider all those factors as well. So, thank you. 
Absolutely. Thanks a lot. And if I maybe just uh, abuse my moderator role a bit <laughs> and also uh, add one, one tiny point about um, uh, bio risks, bioethics, um, bio, um, yeah, bio um, tech, so to say, is that I think um, with COVID, of course, you have seen a complete shift of mindset um, when we look at institutions. And I can just speak about the EU um, because that has been <laughs> the focus of my study. But I think um, with a lesson learned, so to say, of the COVID pandemic, um, institutions have, uh, I think, at least woken up and have seen that they need to be prepared uh, much better um, to tackle those those changes, uh, challenges, and those those risks also emerging from the the rapid speed and also the the cross fertilization between technology and and bio. Um, and uh, as you as you may know, also um, the Commission itself has uh, um, established an entire new Directorate General, so a new DG, um, which is called HERA, which just deals with pandemic preparedness, but not only pandemic preparedness, but also the future of indeed protecting. Um, uh, uh, civilian, you know, uh, yeah, civils, um, people from from um, those risks, uh, also bio risks, um, and uh, I have friends that work also in this department, so it's always very insightful to hear that actually institutions are already thinking about this issue, um, but I think still there needs to be done so much more, and I think um, especially also when you look at inter, uh, in, uh, international institutions, much more foresight, I think, will, will need to, to happen. And foresight, as we know, is a tool. It's not to foresee the future. It's not to, to be a, a storyteller um, of, of what actually happens, but to be prepared and to know certain scenarios and not to know certain risks. And I think there needs to be much more investment in research and development into foresight, into methodologies, into actually training also civil servants, um, capacity building, what is also mentioned here a lot in this context, so that... Um, um, eventually uh, institutions themselves can be prepared and hopefully also then the world as such so that, you know, um, also especially uh, uh, global South nations are not left behind because, of course, you know, if you have more um, capacities uh, to to um, set up your institutions accordingly, then you will be better prepared, hopefully. <laughs> Um, but this uh, should not mean that um, there should be again a race um, between Global North and Global South countries who arrives there first. And um, of course, uh, often um, Global South countries do not have the appropriate resources to, to work on those topics. So I think it's really important that especially international institutions um, such as uh, the United Nations take over more responsibility in this, in this point. Okay, now I talked a lot, <laughs> as my moderator role is abused. I'll hand it over to uh, Paula for the online question. I hope uh, the person is still uh, there and also interested in following. Um, so yeah, over to you, Paula. Yes, I think uh, I can confirm that the person who asked the question is still here and interested and engaged um, because they asked a second question. Um, and I would like to offer it to you, Lloyd, um, to actually take the floor yourself, if that is possible. Um, otherwise, I'm also happy to read your question out aloud. So I think it should be possible if the um, technical department is just able to, I think the person can unmute um, herself himself and, and just ask the question out loud. Um, very good morning, uh, all, all observed. Uh, thank you so much for the session, uh, first and foremost. And it's a great pleasure to be part of uh, a great conversations uh, that would obviously be impacting the way the world is going to be looking at things. Um, so my first question is, oh, sorry, my name is Lloyd, and I'm uh, actually calling in all the way from South Africa. Um, so uh, looking at uh, looking at obviously the great work that everybody's doing on the platform, uh, my first question would obviously then be more around um, uh, what are the eth eth ethical considerations when developing and deploying auto autonomous weapon systems, right? And how do we strike a balance between human control and automation? Uh, what's what? How how does the body obviously as IGF look at that? And then uh, shall I just quickly ask the second question? Sorry, Paula. Okay, awesome. And then the same question is, um, how can AI be leveraged to reduce civilian casualties and uh, minimize collateral damage uh, and obviously armed conflicts and um, what ethical principles should uh, should guide this use itself? Uh, if there's any thought been put around that as well. So yeah, those are my two, well, call them three main questions from my side. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, Lloyd, for, for uh, asking the question and joining us uh, all the way from South Africa. Uh, greetings from uh, Kyoto. Um, I don't know who wants to ask, uh, answer this question. Pete, do you want to go first this time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, thanks a lot for some great questions. Uh, and maybe just to take your second question first, um, I think there's been a lot of talk about, you know, trying to use AI to better target strikes. Um, and reduce the likelihood of uh, civilian casualties. Um, so that's been kind of a way in which people have been talking about using AI to, to reduce the likelihood of those issues. But I mean, I think it's, it's worth also bringing up kind of the flip side of that, which is that, you know, if you can conduct more targeted strikes, you know, we might see more strikes. And I think, you know, when you look at, you know, the use of drone strikes in, you know, the past 20 to 30 years, maybe, that's that's uh, that's the reality. Um, in terms of you know ethical principles being used uh, for autonomous weapons, um, I think the Reaim summit was you know its goal is to to try to get to that. Um, but you know for now it's it's more of a, just a call to action at this point. Um, and I don't think we necessarily have anything um, concrete. Uh, and you know the UN. Convention on certain conventional weapons has tried and and somewhat failed uh, to this point uh, to address that as well. So, yeah. thank you. Um, over maybe to you, Shimona. Uh, thank you so much for those questions, and I think these are sort of the cardinal questions that that we also have to ask ourselves when we when we research around military AI and ethics. Um, uh, on your first question about the balance between automation and ethics, I think that's a very, very pertinent question because um, that's also something that the explainable AI domain is sort of struggling to, to contend with. Uh, in fact, the performance and explainability trade-off is something that's very well established within the AI and, and, and uh, machine learning space, um, which tends to the fact that the more explainable, or let's in this case say the more ethical your system is, um, the less it would be, uh, the less the less performative it would be, or, or the less um, capable it would be in terms of its performance levels. So, so there there is this sort of um, idea established, which sort of pits these two values against each other. Um, my personal take would be that it it probably is a false dichotomy. There's uh, there's definitely a lot that uh, that 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 we're that we're looking into, which sort of makes sure that we're not compromising on one aspect of a weapon systems to, to ensure that another aspect is fulfilled. Um, so in an ideal scenario, of course, uh, this would not even be a question. You would always go for the ethical uh, point over the, the performance factor. But uh, because this is a realistic question, uh, I think the, the idea is more around ensuring that these systems have and retain their level of performance while also having an add-on of ethical or responsible or explainable AI systems um, attached to them. Um, of course, how well they are insured is something that only the country's uh, military systems know about because this kind of information is usually classified um, or is, is behind uh, a number of barriers uh, when it comes to, to weapons testing, et cetera. But uh, the the idea would definitely be to make sure that we're not compromising on one for the other. And I think policy conversations are also um, going according to that tune itself, that we're not policy uh, that we're not um, policing your capacity to 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 build your weapon systems to its fullest capacity. But we'd also like to make sure that these particular systems are ethical enough to send out into the world without causing undue harm. Um, so uh, as of this point, that's where the conversation is stuck, uh, of course, as, as, as and when we advance more in this field, we'll have a lot more nuanced ideas around where this particular balance um, stands at that point. Uh, on your second question, I think Pete uh, sort of summarized it um, perfectly, and I have very little else to add, um, except for the fact that um, maybe in terms of casualties, we're still looking um, more towards civilian AI systems being employed rather than military AI systems. Of course, this line is blurred in a lot of places, but for example, facial recognition systems are, are a good example of a dual-use technology. And um, these systems have been employed in, for example, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, 
um, where uh, soldiers were sort of identified through these facial recognition systems, and then their remains were sort of uh, transported to either side. Um, so, so there are a lot of these uh, these. Uh, so to speak, civilian AI applications, which are being employed in conflict spaces, um, whether or not they minimize civilian casualties is still is still a larger question that we're contending with. Thank you. And the last word uh, to Fernando. Thank you, Lloyd, for your great questions. Very quickly, the research I mentioned before uh, and by the way, I want to uh, thank the Center for Defense Higher Studies to have, for having sponsored this research. It has a table, and so if you go on the LinkedIn profile of Rosanna or mine, uh, you will find this table uh, with uh, five examples of ethical principles which have been developed by UK, USA, Canada, Australia, and NATO. Uh, which uh, talk basically about uh, human moral responsibility, meaningful human control, justified and overridable users, just and transparent system and processes, and reliable AI systems. So these are, um, as we said, the principles mm, which have been developed by single uh, nations, and I just got kind of, su of a summary because they're different, okay? They are not the same they're on the table. Uh, now the problem is to get, uh, let's say, a, a more general uh, framework, as we said, which will have to be negotiated and that will not be easy. So for the collateral damage there, I can uh, speak with uh, cognition <laughs> because uh, I can uh, guarantee you that uh, uh, when I talked about operationalizing the international humanitarian law, there is a process with uh, specific process and procedures with specific rules and specialized legal advisor which uh, evaluate uh, the compliance and uh, let's say clear the commander decision to engage. In, in some cases, I can tell you that, it's not a classified information, we held drones for 48 hours over an area to observe movements before deciding to, to engage, you know. So, oh, um, this means that in, in, in the today's uh, system already, this is, uh, let's say, this issue is of a high priority. That doesn't mean that there are never mistakes, <laughs> unfortunately. The uh, AI, if it is used as a, with the man in the loop, can help doing better. I can tell you that at this point, at this stage of the game, I, I've heard nobody saying that they would uh, relinquish the, the final decision to the machine. I think we cannot think that. We, ca we cannot trust AI to drive a car, which is a simple task. Can we trust it to do much you know, more relevant things? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, being mindful of the time, we're already three minutes over time. Um, I would uh, conclude the session now uh, saying that I think we answered some questions, but we have added probably a lot more questions <laughs> during the conversation. So, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to the three speakers. You can find uh, them all, I think, on LinkedIn, and they're all always more than happy to, to engage um, on the topics. Um, feel free to connect. And also, um, my colleague Paula has, or my former colleague Paula, has put the, the link um, already in the chat to the study, so you can also um, uh, yeah, retrieve it and, and uh, read it uh, on your own, the case study that Fernando and I, I co-authored. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, um, wishing everyone a, a great rest of your day or uh, evening, wherever you are. And um, thank you a lot again for your attention. <laughs>